All right, guys, welcome back to the Home Service Expert. I got a really special guest I'm really, really excited about today, uh, the Mr. Famous Keith Mercurio. He's an expert in sales, leadership, communication, training, and development. He's based out of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. He's a service titan, senior director of executive success. He started that about two years ago. He's uh, the founder and CEO of Ethical Influence Global. And uh, in the past, he he worked with Nextstar. He was the director of training. And uh, for more than seven years, he was uh, at Nextstar, where he built and refined over 20 transformational training programs, oversaw the development of 15-person training staff, conducted over 120 events per year, and trained over 7,000 people annually. Uh, quite the uh, resume there, Keith. <laughs> that's, that's very nice of you to say. I uh I laugh. I laugh about that resume because it's uh, it, it's tailor made for like one thing in this world, and it's what I do right now at, at Service Titan. And and so having come from the industry, it's kind of funny how I managed to meander my way uh, into this place in life. It was certainly a, a non linear path. You know, from every angle, all I hear is just amazing things about you. Uh, this is what we're we're hearing right now. Greatest trainer of our generation, bar none. And a big reason why I am a trainer, it's just, the, unfortunately, it says Facebook user. We said uh, two of the best in the space. You know, Tom Howard and I were together. I mentioned this to you, but he just, he's a raving fan of yours. And um, you're a little bit, you know, my psychology days make me think of like Carl Jung. Uh, <laughs> so it's just, you're, you're, you're very unorthodox, but you get results. <laughs> and, um, I'd love for you just to tell everybody a little bit about yourself and just what your experience was like at Next Star. I think Jack Tesser is one of the best leaders I've ever met. And, um, you know, transitioning to Julian, I'd love to hear just, and then what it's like at Service Titan and just your traveling and, and speaking uh, experience and history. Well, you know what, let's, let's start there with the, because to, to talk about myself would be to talk about the people who have guided me, no question. And I think there's a great, story I just shared about Jack Tester the other day. Um, I was a brand new trainer for Nexstar. I was about eight months into my career there. And there, no, uh, no need to mince any words about this. I was, I mean, I was a, like off to a rock star start, kind of golden boy in my first little bit of stretch of time there. I was going out on the road, booking all these trainings, killing it, coming back with wonderful reviews. And I would come back into the office and take my victory laps and go out on the road again. And, um, and there was about eight months in, I went out with, uh, it was this girl that I was dating at the time and we stayed out too late, made bad choices. And I ended up late for work the next day. And on my drive to work, I was starting to build my case about how I was going to react to the reaction of Jack Tester, you know, how I was going to point out how every single uh, you know, day I've been on time. I've never missed You know, I haven't been out for a day, delivered nothing but results, you know, and essentially was, I don't know if you're like this, Tommy, you're very, you're such a different personality than me. I'm not sure, but I build a lot of conversations, arguments, debates in my head, you know, like, uh, you know, prior to, and, and, and outside of all the conversations that I ever have happen. And, um, and so I'm building this one in my head and I, I get to the office kind of, guarded and, and ready for a confrontation and jack looks up and he goes buddy come on in here and he brings me into his office and he goes hey you okay and i was like well, yeah yeah I'm, I'm okay and immediately just everything that i had built up melted away he was like have a seat he's like jeez you've never never been late like this before everything all right i'm like yeah you know i made some bad choices found myself away from my car and everything else. And he was like, okay. He was like, well, listen, that'll happen. You know, he said, and, uh, he was, you know, I was worried about you. I'm glad everything's okay. And he said, you know, and this is why we have PTO. He's like, sometimes stuff like this happens and you can always just call in and, and take a day. He said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I am going to dock you a, a PTO day. And, um, you know, for, for today, and you can either take it, head home and just enjoy your day, or you can stay and work. It's up to you, but you know, that's, that's how I'm going to handle this. Just where we're a few hours into the day here, as late as you are. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, but you know, that's, that was it. 
And, and he said, you, you know, all right. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, all right, you know, give me a hug. And I just walked out of his office and I was like, oh my God, what was that? <laughs> what was that? And as I would go on to study and, and, you know, really look into, to, to the, the art and science of leadership, you know, what I witnessed was just, it was an astounding demonstration of the fact that he genuinely cared about me. and was worried about me. He also held really clear standards. He let me know how I could handle it differently moving forward. And he checked in to make sure that everything was okay on my end at the beginning and at the end of it. And that was a lesson that would resonate with me for a lifetime. And, and at, well, ever since at least. And, uh, and I think when you talk about like unorthodox, uh, it, it, there's no question I'm unorthodox. I, it's one of the greatest compliments I can hear, frankly, is when people tell me that my stuff is different than anything they've ever seen. Uh, that means the world to me. And it's not that I do it to try to be different, but it's nice to know that somehow there's a different way of seeing an age old study of influence and leadership. Um, but it's moments like that, that where I was led in such a beautiful way that really helped me understand what great leadership looks and sounds and feels like. And it's taking all of those elements into consideration. And yet notice he still held a high standard. But how many leaders would have dropped a hammer, been felt completely justified, written somebody up? You know, I mean, in our industries, I mean, the, the trades, that's like the number one, you know, tool that, that managers lean into is a write up as though that's leadership. Uh, and so I, 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 you know, I draw from influences like that along the way. And um, and that's what informs a lot of my my style of looking at, at how we can be both uh, compassionate and hold people to the highest standards and ourselves most of all you know it's interesting because when you spoke to simon sinek up on stage one of the things i really was fascinated by is what he mentioned when he i don't know if it was on stage or if i just saw one of his videos but he said when i go to four seasons and the people talk to me he's like they genuinely care it's the caliber of people that they hire and i really feel like at a one, uh, you know, this, this might be just, I, I, cause I, you know, obviously I'm here all day, every day, but the people are like, it's outside of work too. It's not just at work. It's like, we come into work, but I don't mind coming in on a Monday morning, you know? And it's like the caliber of people genuinely care. And I think that's what you're talking about is Jack. When I first met Jack, everybody at next star, this was 2017. They said to me, you should really try to get next star to, train garage door companies so everybody was rooting for me and they're like there's jack go talk to him and um i said hey listen i'm a big fan of yours i've read your book uh, i've actually used gail the same person or not gail uh, helena that helped kind of put your book together and we're talking and and uh i said what would you think about getting in the garage door? she goes nope not gonna happen absolutely not and i'm like all righty then nice to meet you <laughs> Uh, but he just did the point and I've watched him train people. I, I was at his breakout session at Pantheon years ago and just the one-on-ones his he's by far the most disciplined cadence, uh, just to the point person I've ever met. Well, he was a world-class operator as a CEO and he really helped me understand and that, that like, I can't say enough about how much Nextar taught me about the importance of operational excellence in a business. I, because I tend to lean more, much more towards the transformational and inspirational elements of leadership. That's where my kind of heart and passion is. You know, I, I had a fair bit of, uh, I think a charismatic ability that I really leaned heavily on in my early days, especially, um, to influence people. What Jack really imprinted on all of us at Nextstar was operational excellence was what would breed the, the grounds for the ability to genuinely care, for the ability to bring in that inspirational, uh, transformational influence. And so I learned in my time at Nextstar, you know, we always wanted to balance our, our trainings so that the ship didn't list too far one way or another towards the transformational or towards the operational that it's a, it's about striking that balance of both and so your your recognition your very quick recognition of 
I mean, I got to study it for eight years. You, you picked it up, you know, instantaneously of his operational excellence and structure um, is, is, is spot on. I mean, he was a, a tremendous operator. He's the ultimate. I mean, if I had to look up, you've read the one thing probably by Gary Keller or, you know, there's a couple of books, Essentialism, a focus is like when I called Service Titan and I called Ara, I talked to nine sales reps. No one would let me into Service Titan. They said, nope, we only do HVAC plumbing electrical. And I got on the phone with Ara and he said, you could surely understand that we do not want to get involved with any other. We want to master these things. And I said, Ara, I, I truly understand and I appreciate where you're coming from, but I don't take no for an answer. And if I got to start an HVAC company to, to, to fix my way into here, and he said, you know what? He said, I've never heard anybody with such passion that wants to get on. He goes, I'm going to send out 10 people. Usually we send out one. I'm going to get, I'm going to set you up for success, but it's on you to make it happen. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, he, he trusted me and, um, uh, you know, now Service Titan, you know, I, Service Titan has changed our company dramatically. Yeah. It's, it's the well, best. And and you've changed Service Titan, Tommy. I mean, you know, you go back to this and and I, I can, first of all, I can vouch for the, in my short experience with you, the premise of, of your unwillingness to take no for an answer. Uh, this, in fact, you texted me and then called me on a Sunday to recruit me into a, a, a speaking role. And this is what I said to you. Actually, it's what I said to my wife. I turned to my wife and I said, you know, it's people like this that make the world go forward. I said, it's not my style. It's not how it's I, I'm I'm much more uh, sort of a, a, a coach, an advisor. I, I struggle to just make the decisions and move forward. It's people like you that when I, I partner with or I work alongside where, you know, I mean, you are always looking out at the horizon and i think i said it to you this way and then when i partner with people like you i'm able to maybe bring a little bit more awareness to the possible wake that you leave uh, as you yeah. as you drive forward but it's you know it's that that personality type is a, a really big deal and uh you know in the spirit in which i can be as complimentary of nextar and and jack you know i that that tendency to just say no immediately, I, though I appreciate the clarity of vision and, and guard, guardrails that, you know, Jack operated with. I, I think similar to, you know, what we've seen I mean, service Titan has grown immensely because of our expansion into garage door and our partnership with you. And I think similarly, I mean, I would certainly nudge next to say, Hey, maybe it's time to revisit this, especially with, but now you've gone ahead and started to build your own version of next star in the garage door industry. So again, you know, this is your own way of not taking no, even if the no was joining next star, you said, okay, well, you know, wait, can we swear on this podcast? We don't yeah, swear on this ahead. podcast. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, you know, I just, yeah. I mean, this is what I heard was fuck it. I'll build my own next star. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's what I love about, uh, you know, partnering with and seeing people like you with that vision and that tenacity, um, which, again is is very different than my own style and so you know that's part of that's part of this work is coming to admire and appreciate styles that are dramatically different than my own you know leadership looks like a lot of different things and and this idea that it's supposed to be one way is i think really really um myopic you know what's really interesting is i met julian at uh, cristiano's event and uh <laughs> i never met him before and i didn't even know who he was at the time he kind of keeps he, he kind of came into that role and really was unknown to anybody that didn't have his training. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he created a huge name for himself. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I just want to pull up a text message because this is the way Julian is. First of all, he invited me out to Minnesota and I spent three days with them and just I mean, we we tore up the town. And I just got a text from him uh on the fifth. At 3.09 p.m., it said, thinking of you, sending love, peace, and power. I hadn't spoken to him in months. And uh, he's just, he's a lot different than Jack. I'd love to hear, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on Nexter, but it was a big piece of your history in the trade. So certainly, um, what would you say the difference in leadership and just your experience with, with Julian? If you, I don't know, I guess he came on as Jack was leaving. Is that for, for when you, or when you left or how did that 
No. So what's what's really fascinating? I mean, I my relationship with Julian is as uh, probably as strong as as there was in, in the time at Nexstar. So Julian came on as an implementation coach and then became the training manager. And as a result, reported to me. So he was he and I were uh, just a one two team for many years. And, and I would attribute the majority of the success of the training organization at Nexstar to Julian. Um, I, I was sharing earlier that, you know, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm good as an advisor. I, I, I'm very thoughtful. I know those are strengths of mine as far as like the, the decisive, you know, moving forward and, and implementing. I, that's an area that I, I'm not strong. That's where Julian among other things he's got a lot of gifts but he's also incredibly strong as an implementer and a doer and so what happened when we started working together was that ideas of mine that i'd been ruminating on for years suddenly started to a get improved by him and then be implemented you know with him and so i i really i think a lot of the the stuff that happened at next star that uh, gets it attributed to any of my um leadership was very much the result of his tenacity and his ability to move forward and your and and he did so without any need for um the limelight or you know making sure that he got credit and and interestingly enough you know he in the end he got all the credit right he became ceo so there's a lesson in there too that he wasn't hungry for you know the constant need for for recognition um, but just kept his head down and kept doing the, the really hard work. And so then he became VP. So that was, that was a, an interesting conversation in that he had been reporting to me and then he got elevated to VP and I started reporting to him. And my first thought was like, man, this is great for him. And my second thought was, I'm really glad I was a, a cool boss to him because he's, now he's my <laughs> boss. So it felt like that was a, a little lesson in its own right. Like how you treat people really, you know, should never vary dependent on, uh, reporting structure that's for sure um in fact it's a really important lesson for leaders to look at if any part of you is leaning into your status your role um feeling like you don't have authority because you don't have a title or anything like that you're, you're looking at all the wrong things that make leadership count and uh and you know julian julian always operated as a leader regardless of his role you know he thought with the same level of ownership as a CEO when he was an implementation coach. And that's why he's had the success and, and, you know, the, the really extraordinary rise in, in next star. And I think is, you know, bringing a really fresh way of thinking of things as well as the maintaining the legacy from what I understand of, of all of Jack's operational excellence. You know, Julian flew out here. He said, listen, you've been to my house basically. I want to come see yours and hang out with you in Phoenix. And he sat right here and he's very calm and content and he smiles. And uh, he goes, listen, I've never seen anybody going at your pace. He's like, my only question for you is at the speed of which you're going. The one thing that I'm going to tell you right now is that you're going to have a battle building leaders. And he said, you're going to have to pull leaders from out of the industry. And I said, I know. I said, you know, one of the things I do is I pride myself on going outside of the industry. I don't really hire a whole lot of people with experience. But uh, that will always resonate with me when he sat right there and he said, uh, you need a complete plan of how to take somebody that's okay, that has natural abilities and bring them up to the level of a leader. Because it's, it's the hardest thing in the trades is to get amazing leaders. And that's something that we've struggled with we've gone to every leadership training read every book um and it's very very difficult because the one thing you can't train is passion it's hard to get people excited and to see the vision and I, i'm just curious from your point of view it's from de leadership development you know ara was a natural leader i look at somebody like ken goodrich that just they're born leaders uh and then some people develop i think i've developed a lot and i still have a long long way to go but um, what is your thought on that? So I want to kind of answer this thoughtfully. Um, there's a couple things I would say. Initial initial blush is is I I balk at this idea that there's such a thing as leaders. 
so much as there's leadership. Uh, leadership is, is how we're being, you know, and what we're doing on a daily basis. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to ever label someone a leader or not a leader too, too aggressively as though that's a constant way of being. I mean, great leaders lack leadership all the time, lack in their leadership all the time. And I, I think we need to be careful about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or, well, or do I need to dive I think, deeper? I think there? what you're saying in my, uh, the way that I'm taking that is uh, leadership is a quality that comes out in leaders and other people. You said Julian at one time, you know, reported to you and maybe wasn't necessarily involved with a bunch of it, but he had the qualities of that. So yeah. Maybe- yeah. There, there's great leadership, but I think we're, sometimes we, we get, and again, this goes back to like this idea of natural born leaders. And I hear what you mean. There's, there, there's a premise around that. I, I think what, you know, I mean, but, but comparatively, for example, John Maxwell says that, you know, leaders make leaders who make leaders. Right. So this is what Julian was talking to and, 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 and to, you know, to look at, and I don't have enough information to say one way or the other, but what I suspect he was warning of or advising towards is this idea, you know, Tommy, high performers that become leaders that, that kind of push from out in front, um, they tend to be very competitive. They tend to not take no for an answer. They tend to be very charismatic in being able to share their, their vision. Um, but what sometimes gets lost in that process is that they take total responsibility for delivering the results and leading with their passion, but sometimes forget that along the way, their job is actually to build, is not to deliver the result, but to curate leadership teams that deliver the result. And so, you know, if I were, if I were coaching you, I would be asking you, what are you doing to build the team that's delivering the result right now? What kind of relationships are you building among your leaders? Not with you and your leaders, but among your leaders. Like what are their relationships with each other and what are you doing to ensure that they're learning to trust and support each other to succeed? Because if you are a naturally competitive person and if winning is natural part of your makeup, you've got to be careful that as you multiply the leaders in your business, that they're not just attempting to replicate your path because there's only one of you, but there's many of them and they may end up competing against each other instead of collaborating to learn to win as a team. So that's where I would, you know, maybe build off of what Julian was saying as, as something that I would just keep an eye on. Uh, but I, I can't say one way or another without you having some really honest self-reflection on that. And then probably talking to your leadership team, you know, and, and one of the questions that you ask a, a leader is if they're being completely honest, when they come to their monthly or quarterly or annual, you know, budget review, would they rather have hit the budget well the other departments didn't, or would they rather have been the one that missed the budget while all the other departments hit? And and what this does it, it, by forcing this binary either or, you know, way of thinking is explore whether the team win or the individual win is more important to them. You know, we read five dysfunctions of a team as a company. And unfortunately, at 110% growth a year, you get siloed. And you start caring a lot about your current team, but not about the whole necessarily. And it's an individual aspect. I wouldn't say that as a an overarching factor of everybody but i hired i hired a president of the company to come on and fill the gaps that i wasn't able to fill because i know i've got a lot of uh issues with my leadership so one of the things that we we discussed was um he said listen i gotta really evaluate you for a few months and what he came back to me and he said listen you are not the issue you're zero of the issue because in fact you're not as involved as I would have expected you to be. You, I didn't even go to our budget meeting. I said, listen, I know what I'm going to do at our budget meeting. I know that I can't shut up. I know that I'm going to affect everybody's mind and I'm going to get too involved. So I said to Dan, I said, here's what I'm going to do. I said, you guys do not come back to me 
with some bullshit. I said, I want some real goals. And I said, I want to know how we're going to get there. But you guys build the road because this is the road you guys got to travel on. And it's not fair for me to influence it. But I said, as far as marketing and sales, I'll get these sales averages up with the the help of the team and and everybody. And I guarantee you, we'll bring the leads. And I failed in a couple markets and we were working on it. And I've got a couple of great people working on it. But overall, I've, I've chose to opt out of a lot of the meetings I used to attend because I know myself and I, I know that it's so hard for me to sit there when someone says a goal and it's, it's, it's like they, they, um, they don't push hard enough. So they call it Tommy goals. They said, here's, here's the bottom that we need to hit. Here's the yeah. stretch goal. And then here's the Tommy goal. <laughs> so, so I love this. And Tommy, the thing I would point out though, is that, whether you were there or not, because you said that you were there now, because you said, don't come back with some bullshit, come back with real goals. You were there. And in fact, what I would, what I would caution and coach you on is the amount of pressure that that creates, but ambiguous pressure. What does that really mean? What's going to, what's going to satisfy Tommy? What does this really look like? And so here's, here's where I would, I would challenge you. I would say, well, you simultaneously say that, you know, I want you to come back with some real goals. I would pull, uh, you know, like one of the great leaders I've seen in this regard is Brad Casebeer down at Radiant and, and what that organization has done. And Brad Casebeer just asked one follow-up caveat to that, Tommy. He said, you know, what do our super stretch like party goals look like? And if you agree to them, are we going to have fun getting there are we going to love getting there because i am not going to sign this team up for a goal which by the way is arbitrary and made up right i mean it's an extrapolation of what we've done against what we think possibility is and then we make it and then we create a relationship with it but within creating that relationship is this going to burn our people out are we going to exhaust you know our our team members along the way are people going to start having you know not not being home for dinner at night with their families all because this goal became more important than anything else so as you create you have such incredible influence and especially with your team but in general just across everything you touch i mean i've watched it now the same way julian acknowledged it's it's an extraordinary pace that you're operating at but are you putting pressure on people to also make sure that they can enthusiastically opt into this goal because it's something that they truly want. And by the way, it's okay, Tommy, if your culture of your organization is we work at, you know, these types of paces and that's, and people know that signing up, so be it. That's okay. You can have any type of company you want. You just need to make sure that it's, it's being transparently, communicated and if that other thing is a concern to you that you also put pressure on them to think about that too yeah i i I completely agree with that i think the main goal when i wrote down a billion dollars on that whiteboard at the last office i wrote a straight line from the top right to the bottom left and i put five grids and i said at an average tech of five hundred thousand, i need two thousand technicians and then i figured out the leads and i called three managers into my office and i said what would we need to do today? We would need a, a, a badass training center. We would need three full-time recruiters mm-hmm. and five full-time trainers. And my, my biggest goal was helping them realize what needs to happen today. And so what I did, actually, I just got off the phone with Jim before we jumped on this call, and we designed a calculator for the technicians. And rather than give them a goal of revenue, I said, listen, what are your dreams? And we've really yeah. worked hard to figure out what people's goals and dreams are. Home ownership, better credit, kids in private school, 10-year anniversary, uh, golfing with my dad on a trip. And so one of the things I try to push is, you want this, that you're going to make some sacrifices along the way. And we need to remind, you know, whether it's your wife or husband and kids, that this is for the good of everybody. But if your goal is to be at home at 4 p.m. every day, I'm good with that. So I think it's important to understand, and I think Tom told you I I've given away 21% of the company to to staff here and they sprint because of what they want. I don't, I know they don't care about hitting a billion dollars. I mean, 
that's an arbitrary number that I chose because it's a, a milestone for us. But ultimately, they're all sprinting at the same pace. Not everybody, but they're all rowing in the same direction for sure because there's a lot of millionaires going to come out of this company. And um, that's what excites me. I mean, ultimately, yes, I love being a company that's on the cutting edge of just technology and what we're doing. But I really feel like uh, it's important to me that they hit their goals, which is sacrifice. It's it's goal setting. It's habits. And it's more important is uh, determination. So so for me, it's, it's like this. Uh, I got to figure out what motivates you and just remind you of what you want, because the way to get there is not going out and buying a snowmobile or a boat. The way to get there is to be very, very uh, determined. And what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, you've got to be um, disciplined. Yeah. And, and what I mean by discipline is just sometimes you might have to work a Saturday, but I don't care if you, I have an, un, for, for my management, it's unlimited PTO. You take off. If you want to work three days a week and you're hitting your goals, I don't care. I'm not, if someone walked in late, I have no idea. I'm not monitoring the front door. We're right. looking for them. They work right. from home half the time. So I'm a, I'm a lot different than Jack in that aspect. I'm like, look, <laughs> I, I really don't care how much you work. I don't, you know, I love if you put in a 70 hour week. I love if you put in a 10 hour week. It's just, I, I'm not a person that's counting hours ever. So I, I don't know if that. Resonated. Well, no, I think this, oh, it does. It does. And, and just keep an eye on that. You know, I mean, this is like, you know, we talked about Ara and his leadership. I mean, one of the things I've watched Ara focus deeply on was his his, the unknown impact of his, what he didn't even realize was intimidation with a comment like that one, you know, just don't come back to me with bullshit. I trust you guys just don't, you know, don't, yeah. don't come back to me with any bullshit. Right. I know, I know you'll do the right thing. It's like a dad saying to their, I know you're going to make the right choices tonight, Tommy. Right. Like that's, there's, there's a certain pressure that comes with that, that, that we need to make sure as leaders that we're paying attention in our leadership that we're paying attention to those little those comments and what message they they do send and that's not a criticism of it it's just an awareness right you may become more aware of it and say i'm good with it and that's exactly what our culture is now a couple things i want to point out for anybody who's who's kind enough to be listening to this right now what what you do so well the two things that really strike me in in the conversations i've had with you and surprise me, by the way, I did not, you're, you're, um, I'm going to say this just as candidly as I can. You're, you're a far more evolved and thoughtful leader than I expected you to be from whatever little bit of like Facebook persona of yours I had experienced. I, I have really marveled at the depth of your thinking, your, your basis of, of learning all the books that you actually do read and do draw from. It's, it's very impressive. And I mean that, um, and 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 you, there's two things in, in what you described in your story. One is when you set that goal, working backwards to say, what do we need to do today to make that future a possibility? This is just good goal setting, and it's astonishing how much people struggle with this, how much organizations struggle with this. And that's why, like, whether it's, you know, reading you know, rocket fuel or traction or um, or you know, getting into any of the other kind of operating systems out there and understanding goal setting uh it's so important that when you set a goal that there's then the using the calendar to say what are the quarterly monthly weekly and daily activities and resources necessary to achieve this the other thing is to make sure um i'll just say this as a one-off we can revisit it that it's in line with your just cause or your vision that's another really important thing that we can talk about from Cynic's work. Uh, but the second thing that you do exceptionally is with your team members. And my God, please, folks, like hear this, that you do not give them revenue targets and now expect them that to matter to them. This is what creates resentment, frustration, uh, disconnect inside of organizations is we give everyone static targets. And now we say, this is now your goal. This is what you should be achieving. And we create 
for our team members and technicians and salespeople, these relationships with these goals that they might be unrealistic, they might be unfair, they didn't come from me, they're just about this. There's no attachment to, to, to any meaning in it. And frankly, it's not even a good way to coach people. That would be like coaching everyone in your batting lineup that they should have a 330 average. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous expectation. There are benchmarks, that's great. But what you do instead is you attach it to what they want, what drives them and then help them see what are the metrics they would need to get there. And then you coach on what behaviors will be critical to achieve that metric. And what, what inexperienced managers do is they coach metrics. They tell people they need to raise their close rate. They need to raise their average ticket. They need to increase their revenue. They need to get more five-star reviews there. That's coaching a metric. What you do is you coach a behavior and, and I haven't witnessed it firsthand, but I suspect you do it this way. I suspect you don't tell people what behaviors they need to engage in. I suspect you ask them if you wanted to increase your close rate, what are two things that you could do differently during the call that would make it more likely that that customer is going to say yes. Or if you're looking to increase your average ticket, what are the three most important components in the customer experience that would help them choose a higher priced item or a more substantial package and still feel great about it, right? So asking guiding questions that help people, not leading questions, guiding questions that help people find their own answers, not leading questions that help them make it seem like it's their answer. That's the bullshit that I watch managers talk about getting buy-in and leading questions and all this stuff. No, you ask guiding questions that help people arrive at their own path to their own goals that are that motivate them. And you do that at a at a glance as well as as anyone I've seen. And I think that's an enormous reason for your trajectory. And that's the part that I want to make sure you're taking time to really think about and make sure that your leaders understand that as well. You know, if, if you really think about it, the first time it was years and years ago that somebody sent me a message and they said, I get to coach my uh, my son's soccer team because of this. It became so much more than money or goal setting to me. It became life changing, it truly, it truly life changing. And I became addicted to changing lives. And, you know, I really do. I. I I love when people fix their credit. I love when they bring a kid into this world and they say it's going to be a great life. And I love it when someone says, I had the worst relationship with my wife and now we get to spend quality time every night together because I'm no longer a slave to my company. And when, when you really look back and you figure out, all I tell my guys is, listen, don't worry about being number one now. Just better your best. BYB, better your best. What can what can we do together to help? Yeah. And, and I'm addicted to training. I'm addicted to, to, to these little things. We are obsessed with role play. And I got to tell you, the first time I brought up the word role play, everybody rolled their eyes. And they said, <laughs> dude, we're not role playing. And now I could go to any corner next door. I guarantee you, if I walk next door, there's 10 people role playing next door. There's There's two technicians that took the time out of their day to come to the training center and work with them, not because they have to, because they want to. And I, I just love watching. I love this equilibrium. I don't want to be involved. I love it evolving without me. I love it that I get to meet new people every day when I walk through this office. I love that the the paint is getting redone right now, not because I asked them to. Right. I love it when I see somebody in the parking lot picking something up, not because they have to, not because I told them to, because they want to. And it's something so I just special. I want to make sure that we clip the quote. I just love watching role play, Tommy Mello. That's important, <laughs> important fact, just as long as we get that quote clipped. But, you know, I would share. So so this is an indication, again, of the, the, the way that your leadership breeds ownership and responsibility. And I love that. And also, you can make it easier on yourself, too, because because when we use language that has a negative connotation, we have to overcome that negative connotation and get them to engage in it. You know, at, at Cindy Powski years ago, 
just said, stop calling it role play and start calling it skill practice or simulation. So it's that simple. She said, she said, adult men don't want to engage in role play with you, but they're more than happy to engage in skill practice or simulation, right? And, and sometimes it can be that simple, just paying attention to our language and not creating an uphill battle, you know, for, for something that could just be shifted in, in, in what we describe it as and, and how we label it. The other thing that, you know, I, I want to just, I want to come back to and, and, and in the spirit of the nuance of language, just offer a thought for your consideration is this idea of changing lives really creates, you know, I, I, like I would, I would even say, just be cautious with that thinking because what that does is it makes you responsible for it. But if you are creating an environment in which people get to change their lives, correct, that hands the responsibility and the credit back to them. Now, your responsibility is to create the environment, the business, the platform, and the model, right? By you yourself as a leader. But then just if we shift from, you know, we're changing people's lives to we're creating a platform, an environment, and a place in which people can change their lives and create the lives they want, that gives them all the credit and responsibility back. And, and frankly, that's the reality of it, because I've, I've, trained at this point, you know, I don't know how many tens and tens of thousands of people along the way, I've never changed anybody's life. And I've had a lot of people walk out of the same exact training event telling me it was life changing and telling me that it was, you know, the worst three days of their life. So it uh, clearly I'm not the critical factor in that they are right. And how they're choosing, how they're choosing to absorb the information that makes a difference. And, and what you're doing is you're really building a place in which people can change their lives. You, you know, you, you and I spoke, I don't know, about a, two weeks ago, and you said, listen, I want you to really think long and hard about your mission to be North America's largest and most trusted garage door company. You, you mentioned to me, I would really change that vision to be the best place to work in North America at a trades business. It, and it really resonated with me. I thought a lot about that, and I, I definitely don't want to just go change it uh, yeah. without the without everybody's impact on that. But, but truly, it is a breeding ground for just. It's just amazing to see. And I definitely want you know. You said some stuff earlier about about just writing people up and putting them on a pip and saying, "What's wrong with you? What's going on? Why aren't you hitting your goals? What's going on, man?" What, what's what's happening? You, you know, sometimes people are going through some stuff at home right. and everybody does. And having a, a heart to say, I'm here for you. Let's work on this together. I'm your friend in this. And you've always had my back and I've got yours. Let's um, let's just have a candid conversation on what I can do. Uh, if there's anything to be more of a, a, a of a friend to you rather than a boss. I, I always say this. I've had coaches that used to make take me to dinner when my mom wasn't home from work hmm. and they cared. They genuinely cared. And I, I had two a days in football and we had two a days for a week straight to play one game. We practiced 10 times to play one time. And that's one thing I'll always bring up is listen, have any of you played sports? Have any of you heard of two a days? <laughs> and, and yet a lot of times we say, listen, we're going to practice for two weeks and then you're never going to practice again for the game. You're right. going to learn in the garage from now on. And so I love calling it practice and I hate the word role play. It sounds like a sexual act of some sort. <laughs> so we always talk about that. We just say, listen, let, let's practice. And, and I always pick up tips. Last week I had Brent Buckley, who's going to do 12 million on tune-ups this year. He's a, a leader. He's out there still doing the work. And it's so impressive to me because he came on and, and we, we do these 15 minute interviews every week with different people. And we play it to the entire uh, technician team. And he said, all you got to really do is care. If you truly care and you think you're offering the best product and you're actively listening, you're going to give great results and you're going to do well. And, and I love when I get to, to show people, they don't always want to hear it from me. And this is why I love podcasting because I, now I just say, listen to Keith. <laughs> he said it the best. Because I don't like it coming from me all the time. Because it gets it gets stale and it gets like a broken record. So, 
I'll share with you a discovery in my coaching that that has been profound and continues to to inform me. Um, because you'll notice it in my conversation that I very often will reference other people who are doing this particular thing well. That's one way that I ensure that I'm um, a citing the original source or an example of it, which which people can attach to, but also that it's not a constant message from me. Right, because that's an exhausting form of leadership. And the other thing that I, I found, Tommy, is that the way in which we're able to most effectively share ideas with people is when we share with them what we're learning, not what we already know. So I continue to find that people are very enthusiastic to learn alongside my learning. They're much less enthusiastic to learn from my teaching. So when I'm sharing with people, I made this mistake this week. I had this error this week. You know, I just I just came off of a coaching session. I was in a training. Uh, I did an offsite. Ninety nine percent of the offsite was was outstanding, but there was a moment where I got contentious with one of the participants. I kind of lost track of my poise. I got impatient. I got a bit aggressive. I let some some natural tendencies of mine out that aren't my best leadership qualities. Well. It was pointed out to me and my initial reaction was to want to defend it. And then I said, no, that's not I, my mantra as a leader is I am kind, patient and totally committed to seeing these men and women at and holding them to their very best. That wasn't kind and patient. That was impatient. That was me having a reaction that wasn't in the best interest of this person. And so I just looked at it. I got that's I need to that's I'm going to apologize for that. And I got on the horn with this person. I apologized and he ended up telling me that this thing had really upset him. And then I shared with some other leaders in the business, by the way, heads up, I who had witnessed it. I apologized to this person and he, they were like, oh, wow, thank you. That, that was actually on my mind, man. Being able to share like, hey, this is what I learned this week. This is where I failed this week. And genuinely, not just for any other reason, but that brought people closer to me than anything that I could have taught them about how they should be. And so it's a really important distinction. So yes, to the podcast and, and bringing in others, that's just brilliant, you know, from your standpoint to, to cite other experts, but also as much as you can humble yourself and continue to share with your team members, what you learned yesterday, last week, last month, what you continue to struggle with, it invites people into the learning. And, and, you know, to kind of cap this off, John Maxwell would talk about the law of the lid and that teams won't develop past the lid of the leadership. Yep. I don't, I don't, I, I agree with that, but I, I don't think that's the whole story. Teams will only continue to develop at the rate at which the leadership develops. And so it's this trajectory that creates a gravitational pull that, oh, this is what it looks like to be a leader at this organization. It's not having all the right answers. It's asking tough questions and admitting when we're wrong quickly. You know, one of our core values with ethical influence is be wrong early and often. And it's about recognizing that it's in our wrongness that we find the quickest path to growth. If I wake up today and everything that I thought turns out to be right, then I had exactly the, the peak of my existence that I can have. But if I wake up and discover that there were things I believe that I'm wrong about, I've just opened up a whole new lid of what's possible and what I didn't know that I didn't know. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. I, I love the way you think about things. It's you, you are, I have, I've really focused on a huge weakness of mine, which is reflection. And it was so hard before COVID for me to look back. And mm -hmm. when, when everybody, when shit hit the fan, I, I have a bunch of trusted advisors I call. I, I, I try to say one of the things I've learned is to plant ideas. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't mean to do it, but when I reflected, I, I realized I used to call whoever wasn't like, for example, if somebody really respected you, like Luke, our COO, what I would do <laughs> is I'd work with you on an idea and then I'd have you call Luke because <laughs> it, it, it sounds bad, but. No, that's one of the no. things I realized that that I've done with a lot of my mentors is if I find somebody really respects them and then 
it sounds bad, but it's almost like planting an idea and making it their idea because I know they're not going to work hard if I got all these ideas. But what I want them to do is, is to find their own path. But by at service time, we brought 15 people with us. You, you saw the bunch of black shirts out there because truly we, we, we send our leadership team to different shops all the time, usually HVAC, HVAC and plumbing, because I think they're the leaders in, in the trades right now. And it's amazing what they come back with. And I, I'll tell you this. I got a huge dis disagreement with, with uh, Luke uh, a month ago. And he said, if you don't want me to do this, I won't. I'll stop right now. And I said, Luke, all I want you to do is make sure that if it doesn't work, you don't stay committed to that idea. Because oh, yeah. I, I just, I, I'm going to let you run with this. But you realized by taking 20 of our top technicians out of the field <laughs> to do a job by job management might not be the best thing today. So I want you to continue to test and just let the numbers guide you <laughs> because it's scary to me. It was really yeah. scary. And I just said, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to let you lead. But it does. There are certain times and I grabbed this book. It was sitting on my desk. It's power questions. One of the things that I really try to do is ask a lot of questions, make people think long and hard. Uh, what, what, why is this going on? And is this the right idea? And give me your, your mindset on making these decisions. And, and some of the times I don't think some of them are thought out. And some of the times they are, I, you know, yeah. it, it's, I, I trust my team. I will tell you, I'm hundred percent committed to a fault uh, to, to sometimes I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Like, like, I, and I don't mind that. I, I really yeah. don't. It's something I've had to release the control. And it's not easy for a guy like me to do that. All right. So very good. So three, three things to, to, to circle back on here that I thought were really interesting. So as it relates to the questions that you're asking, well, first of all, love, so, so this was really important in the coaching and, and again, to point this out to the listeners, this is a really important distinction, not, I'm going to let you do this, but it better work, but I'm going to support you in doing this as long as you promise that if it isn't working, you don't stay stuck on it. That is such a critical distinction in what support looks like, because the 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 former would be more like the don't come back to me with bullshit budgets you know make sure that they're that they're real right that's the one that's sort of like a latent threat this <laughs> yeah. one this one was supportive leadership and coaching because it said look i don't necessarily agree with this but i want you to go forward with it as long as you promise me that you don't stay stuck to it if it isn't working that's fucking great coaching. That's great coaching. That's such an important distinction. One is support with a fair bit of caution. One is support. That's almost like a, or one is, one is like a latent threat. So incredible distinction that I wanted to make sure I pointed out that I heard in the, in the language. The other thing is, you know, this idea of asking great questions, the, what I want to make sure I, I, encourage and even challenge with you is something that I heard in there, which is asking questions to, and then to, to let them think that it's their idea. Be, be careful about that. That's manipulation. And that's what I was, I was recognizing that. <laughs> good, good, good. And that's, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And it's okay, by the way, because we do that. So I want to share with you a, a way that, that I've discovered that we can still have our ideas still be able to introduce our ideas, but not put people through kind of a leading question that is guiding them towards our own answer. And it's really been a game changer for me in my coaching. And it's a simple way of stacking the phrase. So let's say we have this idea popping up about taking 20 people out of the field and, and, and doing this other thing and it gets presented, you know, or, or we're talking about how we want to solve an issue. I'll say to someone, you know, Tommy, I have some thoughts on this, but before I share them, I'd like to hear yours. 
And then I ask the question from a genuine place of curiosity. And here's what happens for me when that, that takes place. One, I think you and I are probably similar in that, that there's in this way that we're competitive, especially when it comes to ideas. Like we like to share great ideas, maybe be thought leaders, you know, have the answer that, that astounds people have a great point that we want to make. And although that can be a strength of ours, it can really limit the growth and the, the thinking of a team that we're responsible for coaching. And so nevertheless, it's still how I'm wired. So when I say, look, I have some thoughts on this, but before I share them, I want to hear yours. It, it allows my brain to pause and not need to get my thing out there. I already set a place for the fact that I will get it out there. But what I realize is that if I share my idea first, I am going to dissuade pretty much any other thinking in the room, unless I've got some really courageous people in there that are willing to disagree with me or, you know, who even have the self-awareness to realize that I might have just shifted their way of thinking with the idea that I shared. And lastly, what it does is it allows me to genuinely listen to what their ideas are and still hold this, a, a, like a sacred place where I can return to my ideas after and not smash them, not make them feel like their ideas were worse. And what I found, Tommy, 50% of the time, my initial idea is probably still a better idea. And 50% of the time, the other person's idea is superior. And had I not asked it the way I asked it, I might have never heard their idea. And so that's a strategy that I've been able to develop for being able to not manipulate people, not ask them leading questions to try to get them to my solution, but still be able to make a stake that I have some thoughts on this, but also open up a forum where they get to share theirs first so that I'm not leading them in one direction or the other. When I went to Jack's breakout session, he said, I've never implanted it. Basically, he said, my team, my one-on-ones, they present to me. The what went well this week? Where should I, where could I spend more time? What did we amplify of our core values? Uh, what are some tough conversations? Like, like he's got that whole guide. Yep. And then what I added to his guide, and I, I got to tell you, this is, I am horrible at this. I am not, the, the, <laughs> I, I, but I love it. But one of the things on the back sheet is I said, okay, what are the person's dreams? Who's important to them? Their kids, their dog, mm. you know, Emmy. Um, Nicely said, done, bud. What, what are some of the, uh, I, I felt like what Jack, and Jack's not missing a whole lot of anything, but I felt like what, what are some of the things outside of work? That, because those conversations matter. And, yeah. uh, and they're very interesting and it brings some, it's actually something somebody could look forward to and, and, it, and it forces reflection. And I think it's fabulous. Really yeah. Fabulous. And two, two things I'd like to say one, Jack's missing plenty. Trust me. I worked for him for eight years. He's missing plenty. <laughs> and, and so are you. And so am I. All right. And, yeah. and that's okay. Now, the thing I want to point out about the, the reflection, and I love what you're doing. I think you are amplifying that one-on-one -on -one by, having you know a, a a spreadsheet or or some sort of data points about how to check in on this person i mean i when i put somebody's name in my phone these days i'll usually put their name plus their spouse's name plus their kids names so that every time they call i'm reminded of all the people i should be asking about and checking in on because i don't necessarily naturally do that okay and that's that's about being resourceful. Okay. And, and I, this is what I want to share with you about what I just heard you say. You said a huge weakness of mine is, is reflection, not reflecting. But I want to make sure that you understand that that is a limitation of yours that's directly tied to a strength, which is that you're always looking forward. I mean, Tommy, I spend 99% of my time reflecting thinking about everything that's happened and, and just heard and what I just said. And I mean, hell, it's, it's an exhausting place to be. And I need people like you to get me to look forward. 
But if we suddenly turn you into this great reflector, we're going to take away your superpower, which is looking forward all the time. So there's a difference between working on a weakness versus being resourceful and self-aware about a weakness or a limitation. Because if we start focusing your energy on reflection, then we're going to take away your superpower, which is forward thinking. That's, but if that, we if if we yeah. help you become aware that sometimes you don't reflect and maybe create some very like, you know, specific ways of reflecting that are actually forward thinking. What's one lesson that you've learned that you want to make sure you don't forget moving forward? Something like that. Brief amount of time, low energy expenditure that maximizes your ability to quickly learn and apply. That's beautiful. Or surrounding yourself with people that you, you sit there at the end of slamming away at some vision and go, now what am I missing? And you let them live in their superpowers, which is to look back at lessons past or, you know, potential impacts that you might not have heard. These are ways of becoming resourceful, thoughtful and self-aware, but without limiting what is your strength. I don't coach people on fixing weaknesses, man. That's a horrible place to spend time. I coach people on maximizing their strengths and mitigating the impact of their limitations on themselves and on others around them. That's that's uh, that helps a lot because I, I will tell you that that I've never really focused on my weaknesses. There's a great book on my shelf over there called Off Balance on Purpose. And um, people always say, I want to live this perfectly balanced life. And I want everything. I want my work-life balance. And I'm like, oh, okay, what does that mean to you? Because right. because I'll tell you what, if I'm working all the time, um, I'm not praying 10 times a day and probably not getting all my workouts in. If I'm working out three times a day and the perfect diet. But, but what I've learned is my trainer has to show up to me. That makes me accountable. I pay a lot extra for him to come here and work out because I've, I've learned my weaknesses. So I've surrounded, I know all my weaknesses and I know a way to set up my life. And I, look, look, there's a lot of weaknesses I still do, but I've really tried to take away the excuses of, I can't go to the gym today or, you know, uh, right now I'm working with somebody that's going to be preparing all my meals. So to make it easy, I bought all these color coordinated and I'm not this guy. I'm not a C type. This is probably the most C-type thing I've ever done. But I bought all these color-coded Tupperwares. <laughs> and then I just, this is what I like in these. And um, and then I'm working with a dietitian to make sure it's getting me to where I want to be. But, because I've always gone to leadership and the best of the best. I, I, when I lost at ping pong, this is a story that's on TikTok. I hired the number one trainer in Arizona to help me <laughs> beat one guy. And uh, that was uh, my GM at the time. So, so. I think it's great to be aware and get help. And I've always, I went to rate my professor and I went to five different colleges at the same time because I, I had a really good organic chemistry teacher. I was pre-dental. So I went to five because to, I stacked the deck. And I said, this teacher is going to teach me the best to get through my test. And also it's going to be a lot easier to learn and easier to get an A in that class. So I, I, I've always tried to just go straight to the, the source yeah. and get, get the best of the best. Uh, this is this is wonderful. And there's so many lessons. I You know, it's funny because when we we had our first conversation, I, I you know, if, if you were to say what percentage of the time you were talking and I was talking in our first conversation, what would you what would you guess at? I have my answer, but I'm curious what yours is first. Uh, you know, I was probably 60, 40. I'm usually 80, 20, but um... <laughs> I would have put it at 80, 20. So, so as I was preparing for this podcast, I was like, I don't even know how this podcast is going to go. If I'm going to be mostly listening or mostly sharing, you know, like I'm not really, I'm not really sure. But in that preparation, I had no problem because the stuff that I'm hearing from you is exceptionally evolved. It's really, really evolved. I, and you know, I have a, a sign behind me right there on the shelf next to the gin that says uh, what our niche is at ethical influence global. And it's to unlock a magical level of influence in already exceptional leaders. And, you know, this is where I've decided to focus in life because it's like in the course of this call, it's not 
massive shifts. It's not these 180s that that make, but taking someone like you that is absolutely just this like it's amazing watching how fast your neurons fire. I mean, and I mean that like you 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 know oh like I said this and then I see you reach for a book, you know hey there's this reminds me of this. I mean you you make connections fast, and now if we take you and just up that awareness that nuance in language that distinction and what you're thinking is on this or exactly how you're expressing this or what's your intent when you ask that question man i it's it's remarkable and now this is how i learn to influence people it by it, in in multiples because a leader like you with how many people are in your organization right now 500 and how many people are we expecting to listen to this podcast uh, uh 15000 Okay. So that's influence, right? When, when there's going to be people out here that I'll never meet, you'll never meet that listen to this and they do something different in their business of 500 people. And now we're, now we're starting to have the potential for, for creating thinking that can create an environment that, that is world altering. Right. And so, you know, this is the stuff that, that I love to, to dial into. And I so appreciate and hope that people keep hearing as you continue, because you'll continue to listen to Tommy's podcast, right? They're they're here for you and your guests. But this is a you know a singular appearance with me. Keep listening to the way that Tommy is constantly seeking others and advice, and then saying, "Oh yeah, I could see that. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's different." Versus trying to return volley with an example of how he already knew that thing. That's if you listen for that, you're going to see and Tommy, you, you know, you, you seem to, it seemed to resonate with you when I talked about that idea of being wrong, but you do it very quickly and you do it by acknowledging, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Oh, that's really fascinating. And not only do you make me feel like I'm bringing value, but it immediately demonstrates how quickly you're willing to hear somebody else's opinion and not try to return volley to show how much, you know. Now, the one caution I would have for you, different, different than Julian's, somebody who achieves at your level, I would make sure, and it sounds like you've got the right anchors for this, but I would make sure that there's also a distinction that you're studying, that you have self-worth in who you are without it needing to be attached to achievement. You know, Tom Howard said you might make me cry, but I'm not going to cry on this episode. But no, it's it's interesting. You know, I, I why I, not? I, Wait, why not? Why well, aren't you no, going to cry I, on this episode? Why would you say that? Well, well, just it's it's it hits home pretty hard. But at the end, what of the day, about that hit home? What about that hit home? Well, I just I, if you look at everything, I, I I always talk about legacy. And what is a legacy? When you look back at someone's life, who did they affect? Who did they help? And, and Help them help themselves. That's what I'll take from what I've learned today. Who did I help help themselves? So, and well, that's what I consider an accomplishment. I, I do feel like, uh, <laughs> let it rip, Tommy, grab a tissue. <laughs> um, I do feel like there's, uh, I do look at people's lives. And, and you know, I always said there's only one competitor right now for me, and that's Elon Musk. But I do look at, I do have self-worth. And I never once thought about, because I don't take the time to reflect. I've never like, I don't think about like I, I I don't look back at things and I'm not like oh when we celebrate big wins it's a short it's it's for an hour and then I say time to move forward and I think almost to a fault but uh, definitely reflecting and, and taking some self worth and just saying uh, I don't know I, I don't know it's just something I gotta really think about. I don't have okay. any idea. So, so to be clear, I, I never, the goal is never to make anyone feel or do anything, but I do want you to notice how quickly you wanted to get out of that moment of reflection and you know, whatever discomfort it brings and whatever's there for you, that's where there's something really powerful for you to explore 
now or in the future. And so all I did was just bring you back to what I felt like and saw that you wanted to get out of real fast. And, you, you know, you kind of went into to some of your your known scripting, as it were, things that you I always say, I always say, which brings you back to what you're comfortable with and got you out of where you were uncomfortable there for a moment. Doesn't have to be now, doesn't have to be ever. But when I work with extraordinary performers, I've watched the fall when people sell to private equity and suddenly they're not the owner anymore, not making their own decisions anymore in the same way. When people retire, when people step away from careers. For myself, Tommy, we talked a lot about Nexstar today. When I left Nexstar, do my, I had no idea how much my identity was wrapped up in Nexstar. No idea. And I went through astonishing depression as I tried to figure out who the fuck I was without that. And then realized that I had attached, I created a whole life around achievement and being impressive with no sense of self, self-worth with, without that achievement. So when I hear, I just listen and I, if there's something there for you, it's there for you and it's yours to explore. Uh, it's definitely something I'm going to reflect on and uh, just really think about because I, I go back to better my best. Uh, I, I just consider achievement and, and it's growth. It's personal growth too. And it's, oh man, I don't like having conversations like this because to me, um, I like to get the feelings out of it. That's just who I am. And it's something I need to focus on. When people talk about feelings, I'm like, let's move on. And it's something very deeply rooted uh, yeah. that I could spend a lot of time on. Uh, and I probably should. <laughs> well, and, and the, the only thing that I would point out there is that it's a feeling that keeps you from wanting to deal with feelings. Yeah. So it's not that you operate without feeling. People who are logical and, and see themselves as logical think that they operate without emotion. That's not at all true. It's that logic creates a sense of comfort which is a matter of emotion and how they feel. And so they want to be comfortable. So they stay in the logic. Right. And yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. particularly if control and comfort are come together for you, we make sense of it and then we move forward. And so that's, it's great. That's great that you recognize that this is not a place that you like to spend time, but it's uncomfortable is what it is. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think these conversations, there's a book but, on my shelf called Tough Conversations, and it's not necessarily always needs to be a t it's a tough conversation for me internally. Yes. And, and it's a little bit different because I'm not used to having these conversations. I don't think I, I don't think you have the, the what you do is have these conversations often <laughs> and um, you're comfortable with them. And, and, you know, you go into someone's past. Sometimes it's like this. Sometimes I don't want to go to the doctor. More because, you know, and I think a lot of people do this. My um, my stepmom just died because she didn't go to the doctor when she was bleeding and she had really bad cancer. She would have gone when she had that. She would it could have been fixed. And I think that's exactly what you do is is don't go too far down this road without because once you but you told me this last time we talked. Once you once you see it, you can never go back. Right, you can never unsee it, which is why I don't do it with people who are unwilling. Unless they invite the conversation, I don't do it. I won't because it's it's there's a reverence. You got to respect people's place and and where they're at. The only thing that I would um, share differently, I, I'm not comfortable with these conversations, Tommy. I that these are not natural for me either, um, and I don't. I also don't seek them or necessarily you know like uh, try to. I, I certainly don't try to create them. I'm just present to them when they're there and. Before I came on this call, the only thing I did to prepare for this call was to, you know, fundamentally, other than you know, your typical, you know, physical preparations, was I, I repeated my mantra to myself. And so before I got on this call, I said, I am, I am an instrument for learning and not the source. I am kind and patient and totally committed to seeing this man and holding this man to his very best. This man is brilliant, courageous, and in the perfect place in his life for our paths to cross. He's awesome. I'm awesome. Today's the day, and now is the time. I love that mantra. <laughs> All right. 
Now, Fantastic. when when you just wanted to move off of that, everything in me wanted to let you move off of that. Right. However, I had already called myself to show up as seeing you at and holding you to your very best. And to hold you to your very best in a conversation we're having about leadership, about learning through leadership, about how many times a week do you tell people that they need to be, that, that, it's, that you don't grow in their, your comfort zone? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And Not so here you, here you are being uncomfortable and wanting to get back to being comfortable, and you're the leader who's going to lead with this massive influence. I'm going to see you at and hold you to your best. It's not because it's comfortable. It's because that's the version of me that, that I summoned to this conversation today. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, really, it really is. And, um, you know, if you really look at the first four to five years of your life, mm-hmm. I think that's really what, what you got to get back to is what caused – you to make the what caused you to turn things off what t- caused you you know and it, it could go back to the day that i saw you know my dad um cheated on my mom you know stuff like that so it was uh <laughs> it's pretty impactful now that i think about some of these things but i learned to turn a lot of things off and, but it's really important that i don't always keep those off because it's not fair to the people around me but you went deeper uh, didn't you <laughs> that's a, uh, brother that's that's pretty special what you just shared man i just want to honor that yeah well you know i forgive my dad and i think my mom does so that is what it is but so, uh so look man i just I'll, I'll show you here the reaction that i just had to that all right so you asked earlier about being inspiring you know do leaders need to be inspiring you can't be inspiring unless you're inspired. And as far as compassion is concerned, you can't teach compassion unless you're compassionate. And you sure as hell can't teach forgiveness unless you're willing to forgive. And you just go in there, this, it brought tears to my eyes. Right? That, dude, that's, and if you don't recognize how fucking powerful that is or how strong that is, then, then you've got a misunderstanding of what it looks like to be a strong leader because that level of vulnerability right there is what brings people in. And then, then you turn on your charisma. Then you turn on your motivational mindset. Then you attach to goals. And now people know that you're not just a, an icon, but you're a human and they want to walk alongside you and they want to be a part of this journey with you and they see what it looks like to have to face their own shit in order to grow to be bigger yeah well there's plenty plenty of shit here <laughs> you know it, it's, it's one of those things where you really look back at your childhood and you could really in it, you could figure out why you make decisions you could figure out the things that really you avoid and the, the the feelings that are attached to those. And it, it's, it affects a lot of relationships in a very impactful way. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to one more one more opportunity here. I want you to say the same thing you just said, only say it as an I statement rather than a you statement. So I avoid certain discussions and certain feelings. And uh, I definitely need to be aware of when I'm doing that. That feel different? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's so that's, and I always say you because I, I don't, I don't, I don't own it when I do that. Yep. That uh, amazing. And I just got chills when you said that. Um, what an incredible recognition because that's exactly a little sneaky game the non conscious plays to seemingly acknowledge something, but actually defer it into a you statement, or sometimes we'll do it as a we statement versus an I statement. And when it's an I statement, it forces this complete experience of ownership and it internalizes to something very real for you. And that was fucking amazing. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Listen, this is fantastic. Uh, I don't, I don't mean to do this and I don't, if you got a few minutes, I want, I didn't want to bring up one thing on this podcast that I thought was really impactful last time we spoke is, 
you know, you do a lot of work with service Titan, especially the executives. And we spoke a little bit. Vahe and Ara are, are, are heroes to me. And um, me too. Me too. And you said you you constantly see these guys making decisions that are always pro for the trades. It's never because I said I said to you this exact question. I said, <clears throat> as a bank, as a business, and having investors like Service Titan does, there's a fiduciary responsibility to the holders. You're holding their their treasure, their their money, and a lot of their time. And you said you constantly see them making ethical, influential decisions towards the trades, always the business that they serve. Always. And that was very impactful for me. And I just wanted to make sure before this podcast ends, because I think that's so important because I said, I've been on their investor calls. I've talked to four potential investors and they just said, how could, would you be willing to pay more for this service? It was all about, would you pay more? Would you do this? Would you... What if they increased your, your your cost per technician by twenty dollars? What would you do? Then you said I, that every day you see them making very tough decisions that are always towards the business owner. And I really thought that that was important that people hear that because those are the type of people they are. Oh, Tommy, I can't, I I couldn't. So th there were two decisions I made when I left Nextstar. One, I would only work with companies in which the uh, the the leadership was willing to engage in this coaching. So for example, could you imagine if you hired me to work in your company, but you weren't willing to have conversations like this, but you thought all of they, they, those people should, your people really need this, right? So I wouldn't work with companies in which the highest level wasn't working. And I would only work with people who I was aligned in my values with. And I got, I got to meet R and Vahe, you know, back at Nextstar, probably in 2014, I think 2013, something like that, very early in their, in their trajectory. And then I would eventually come to work with them in this capacity with the privilege to, to be executive coach to them and to sit in the room while they make the hardest decisions imaginable. And now they've got thousands of Titans as employees. They've got tens, tens of thousands of employees and they're every single time I watch them say things like this. Well, I don't care, you know, what we could do but we promised them this. And so we're going to go back and we're going to make sure that we stay true to our word. Or uh, I hear things like, no, we're going to honor the relationship and what they meant to us in our growth path, regardless of where we are today. Or they make decisions and they say, is this what's best for, and they do make this call. And this is hugely important. Is this what's best for you know our vision of becoming the operating system of the trades? All of these are the factors, but they never, ever make a decision about what they can do if it's not in alignment with what they should do and they never make a decision that's outside their value set and these are you know i mean i'll speak to r and vahe but that entire executive team because of course they're bringing in people that are sharing in their values ara and vahe it's it's one of like i wish i just i wish that people could bear witness to the conversations i get to bear witness to because although they might disagree with something that they see, you know, on the user end of Service Titan, or they might have their their issues with the way Service Titan's handling something, if they could see the root decision that was made at the highest level and the values and the vision that were attached to it, they'd disagree with it perhaps, but they would never question how beautifully the decision was arrived at. And uh, and I I mean what they ascribe to. And you got to remember, these are still young founders. These are not seasoned career leaders. These are young founders who built this software themselves and then have somehow navigated through this extraordinary trajectory and have investors that they need to think about, have all of these new factors. Think about the rate that they have to be growing as human beings in order to sustain this type of growth for an entire team, organization, and industry. And then lastly, this is exactly what they do in alignment with what Simon Sinek said. They make decisions based on their just cause, becoming the operating system of the trades, and their values, which are built around the type of team that they want to have, being obsessed with customer success. That's what Ara always talks about. 
in private meetings, not for the public, in our meetings. That's what you hear him talk about. And ensuring that we are changing lives, creating the platform to change lives inside and outside of our organization. They lead with the just cause. They support it within their values to make sure that they're aligned in their integrity. And then they move forward with those decisions, even when they're tough ones, or even when they might mean short-term sacrifices to investors, short-term sacrifices to bottom lines and so forth, or tough questions and tough conversations that have to be had with customers to ensure long-term success. None of this shit is easy, man. And boy, I, I marvel at how much they have to balance and guess who is showing up for coaching sessions every other Friday and taking a hard look at themselves and I won't show it to you, but I've got their three, six, I'll, I'll show you the backside of it so that nobody can zoom in on the details. Although these are all the good things, but I've got Ara and Vahe's three sixties on my desk with all the anonymous feedback from 15 to 20 different people that these two men sit there and absorb and reflect on and make tough, tough, have tough internal conversations along with interpersonal conversations to keep growing, to be the leaders that support this industry. Um, you can question a million things, but what you cannot question is the heart and soul of that organization. I promise that. I, I want to add one thing that's important to me. I, um, I called our up <clears throat> and I said, Hey man, you, you're like, you're the reason we are what we are today. And it would mean a lot to me that you could show up and, and just pop into vertical track. And um, he goes, can we do it in a panel? <laughs> and uh, I said, hell yeah. And um, he flew out just to be there with us. He's got the busiest schedule of anybody. And he said, hey, I could fly in, but I got to fly out to be in my soccer practice with my son. Yeah. And he goes, I could only come in for a couple hours. But I want to hang out. And a person walked up to Ara with four technicians. Four. <laughs> and he said, Ara, I'm having some problems with this. Ara got on an hour call with him the next day. So, I, you know, that, that, that this is the reason, you know, I could be at any. Uh, that now, now we could have developed our own CRM and done a bunch of stuff. But I believe in them. And I believe that they're, they do care. And it's genuine. Oh. And they're just, they're. They're the best. <laughs> well, if if any, yeah, I mean, I I don't want to I don't want to overstate it or over politic it. I I just I cannot uh, I cannot speak more highly. I mean, it's that's across the board. There there, I work with Brad and Sarah Casebier. I work with Will and Shanna Blanton, and I work with Ara and Vahe, and uh, and their teams and their orgs. You know, from Radiant to Blanton's to to Service Titan. And each one of those people and pairs demonstrate the highest character, the highest level of compassion, along with being extraordinary visionary leaders who I see it as my job just there to coach and support. And, uh, and man, I, I, that is, you know, out of all the things I've accomplished in my, or anything I've accomplished in my life, not to say like there's all these things, anything I've accomplished, I think my finest accomplishment is the people I get to work with uh outside of the people that i consider my friends no you're, you're a hell of a guy you've done a great job and uh you know when we talked the other day uh, and i'll close up with a few questions here just that i do on every podcast but uh, the other day when Bree's like oh my gosh she's like you need to talk to keith more because she was in the she was she's like i've never even heard you like that so it's very powerful what you do and i'm a big fan and uh i really appreciate the time today as as we close out i ask uh if someone wants to reach out to you what's the best way to get a hold of you keith uh so ethicalinfluenceglobal.com is my website and there's lots of resources on there along with any contact info uh that's great you can always reach out to me at kmercurio at service titan that's also available um and uh you know i mean just in general like you'll find my you know, just frankly, you're going to find my cell phone number on the website. So you can, you can reach out to me and whatever medium works best, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, I'm, I'm, I'm on all those spots. Give you a call on a Sunday like I did. Um, yeah, no kidding. 
and and then is there a few books that are outside of the norm of uh e-myth revisited and um rich dad poor dad and influence and some of these other books what is there three Let's books see. that really yeah i'm back here i'm gonna pull a page out of tommy mellow's playbook and let's see here one of these is very obvious oh this is a good one okay yeah ah there's there's a bunch but um okay so as far as I, I i don't have a copy of it live with me i have it on audio which is uh on audible which is um uh, Simon Sinek's recent one, The Infinite Game, which I think is a, a non-negotiable for leaders to read. Uh, so Simon Sinek, The Infinite Game, I think it's his best work yet. Um, tribal Leadership, Brad K. Spear introduced me to this. This is a critical, critical read uh, and absolutely game changer for me. Um, Life-changing book for me is Plato's Republic, specifically The Allegory of the Cave. So you know, you, you spoke of my style being unorthodox. It may be because it's, it's influenced by authors from hundreds and, you know, even thousands of years ago. And so it's, it's been around. It just maybe has been lost a little bit. This one, I think most everyone has read, but specifically chapter five, I, I don't know if you could habit five, you know, seek first to understand then to be understood. Um, just keep rereading that like as many times as needed. And then uh, trillion dollar coach, the story of Bill Campbell um, that, yeah. is just a remarkable, remarkable book. And, uh, you know, and then just, just, yeah, it, I mean, these are, these are books that, that changed my paradigm in how I coached and how I thought some ways reinforced some of my real core values, which was a, a beautiful thing. Bill Campbell reminded me that it's okay to tell people I love them all the time. Uh, as I started getting like a little concerned, whether that was okay in this new corporate environment and everything else. And I go, you know what, it's up for them. It's up to them whether they embrace or reject that, but I'm going to keep telling people I love them because I do. And so you know, there's there's certain things in here that totally change the way we think, and there's certain things that reaffirm the way we think, and I think it's important to seek both. You know, I, I felt like we went 20 minutes, and it's an hour and 32 minutes. Uh, last thing I ask is, uh, I had a lot of questions on here. I didn't hit one of them, but I think it was very profound, the, the direction we took this podcast. But we, we talked about a lot of great things, and I, I definitely impacted from this. Uh, but we, we probably didn't, if you had to just close this out with a final thought, maybe something we didn't address, maybe just something that everybody needs to hear or just take action on or whatever you think you want to end on. I'll give you the uh, stage to close us out. Um, I really appreciate that. And thank you for not following all the questions that you had, because that's not a conversation, right? What you did instead was you had a conversation and you actually listened to what I had to share and you changed what you were going to say next because you listened to me. Uh, that's what chapter five is all about. And so, you know, my friend and, and mentor Jack Needham taught me in, in the spirit of listening to listen for the last three words. And what, what that meant to me was to stop formulating my next question, my next thought, my next response, halfway through somebody's sentence, because although maybe I've learned to not actually interrupt somebody when doing that mentally, I've stopped my listening and I end up not really hearing what that other person had to say. And so I'm continuing in this practice to, to learn, to ensure that people are heard, not that people feel heard. And I think that's a really important distinction. We can't control how people feel but we can get really clear about our intent to ensure that they are heard and give them a chance to feel heard. And uh, so that would be uh, my thank you to you for today. Uh, you made me feel heard. My thank you to your audience that, that listened to this and, uh, and, and hung in here all the way maybe to the end even. And, uh, and for all of you, that's a, a gift that I would uh, ask you share with the people in your life. Well, Keith, you are an amazing man, an incredible coach, and just a powerful human being. So once again, I uh, deeply 
deeply appreciate this and uh one of the best yet so uh and i've been doing this now <laughs> for for a long time so this is fantastic i appreciate you tommy thank you so much this was a real honor and you're welcome you're welcome that's great thanks everybody for listening i'm gonna go ahead and end this here